Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is DAT IQ, the metrics that matter with my friend Samuel Parker. Samuel is the Associate Director for DAT Freight and Analytics Shipper Segment. DAT operates the largest truckload freight marketplace in North America. Shippers, brokers, carriers, news organizations, and industry analysts rely on DAT for trends and data insights based on a database of $150 billion in annual market transactions. DAT, or DAT, IQ, provides freight intelligence to inform your budget and procurement strategies so you can navigate market volatility with greater confidence and agility. So please take a listen to my interview with Samuel Parker. How's it going, Samuel? Hey, Joe. Doing great. How are you? Doing fantastic. We're talking on a Friday afternoon. It can't be much better than that. So Samuel, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Samuel Parker. I live in beautiful Denver, Colorado. Bright, sunny day today so far. I'm with DAT Freight and Analytics, specifically the DAT IQ side of the house. And I am the segment lead for our shipper business. So I help lead all of the commercial activities related to DAT shipper go-to-market. Nice. So for people who are not in this, not in the truckload space, please explain what DAT does. And by the way, I called it DAT sometimes, but I think, I know I hear people say DAT, and but you said DAT, so I'm going to start saying DAT. So, but anyway, please explain the businesses that you guys are in for the truckers and for, um, for all the people in the logistics space. It's funny, Joe, the, the DAT versus DAT is, is a raging debate even internally. So I, I don't think there's a wrong answer. So it, it is really interesting because I think even if people are broadly aware of DAT and what we do, the specific portion of the business that I work in is probably the most nascent and least well-known. So DAT was started 50 years ago, dial a truck signage around our offices. And so it was essentially a physical load board where you could walk into a, a truck stop as a carrier, as a trucker, and pick up a, a call, call in a posted load that was up and throughout the years. That technology has evolved. We now have the largest load board in North America. It's not physical anymore. It's digital, right? Through apps on your iPhone and on your Android and on your computer. And we serve hundreds of thousands of carriers. We serve thousands of brokers. And Shipper, the area that I'm in, is really where we're just getting started. So DAT has continued that load board business all the way through thriving business today. We attend Matt's and, and all of the major trucking shows. The lesser well-known side of the business and where I sit is what we call the DATIQ side of the house. So that is the the analytics in our freight and analytics, right? And so essentially what we do is we capitalize on all of the loads and all of the freight that flows through DAT's network, as well as rely on our partnerships with our customers in the broker and shipper space to aggregate all of this freight data and make it usable for people who are trying to get stronger visibility into what's going on in the market, what they should pay, how rates are shaping up. And so that's the side of the house that I sit on. Yep. So I've talked to people on the about DAT or DAT in the past. I think I talked to Chris Kaplis on some probably a few years ago. And I forgot if he told me or if somebody else told me what percent of freight goes through DAT every day. Oh, from a national perspective, I, I think, unfortunately, that's probably proprietary. It's a good chunk. <laughs> it is a very sizable chunk, especially when you break it out to specifically the spot market. Yep. And I think that's really significant because right now I could say, hey, I've got all this data. I've got 20 Excel spreadsheets full of data on a lane. And you go, when is it? It's about a month old, but it's good. No, it's not good if it's not today, right? And if... if and and he says, oh, is that brokers? Is that the broker rate, Joe? Or is that the carrier rate? And, and is there a lift gate on that? And all of a sudden, it, it seems easy when you start 
down the data thing, but having good data and a lot of it is the key to this business. Absolutely, Joe. And I think it's a three-sided game and you've got the, you've got the carriers, you've got the shippers creating the freight and you've got the brokers in the middle and, and everybody wants a fair shake and everybody needs to maintain levels of profitability or thresholds within spend to, to make sure that everything gets to where it needs to go and you're hitting your key metrics. And if you don't have that data, then it's a difficult field to play in, if not impossible. Yeah. And I will say, and I'll say this again later on in the podcast, but I'm of the opinion that if I'm a shipper, I want my 3PL, if I have one, my broker and my carriers, I want them to make a good living. So during COVID, when rates spiked, I recognize their costs went up and I'm going to have to pay more. I don't want to get, I, don't, I want them to get a good pay. I, I don't want them to suffer. But when rates go down, I, we're going to have that conversation again. The rates are down. Other than just pure trust in your partners, which is how much we have of that, I don't know. But this is why we need that dat in the middle. It's the beginning of a good conversation. Here's my rates. Here's debt or debt so the rate should be. Maybe I'm above it. Maybe I'm below it. Depending if you're a shipper or a carrier, you might be happy or sad that day. <laughs> but we need good data so we can have good conversations because the data isn't for fun. The data is the beginning of conversations. Absolutely. And I, I think DAT is in a really interesting position where, as I mentioned, we serve all sides of that sort of flywheel of freight, right? And so we largely view ourselves as an agnostic player. We're a provider of data and, and we help level the playing field to make sure that everyone has equal visibility. I started my career uh, in the shipper space in manufacturing and industrial supply chain before eventually moving into supply chain software, Stinset, Blue Yonder, JDA. So you've lived on both sides. So we'll, I want, we're going to do a market update. So everyone wants to hear mark, the market update from Dat. But first, you started to touch on your background. Give us your background. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Some career highlights before you joined the juggernaut that is DAT or Dat, depending on the day. Yeah, absolutely. Grew up in beautiful Des Moines, Iowa. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, but spent my, my formative years in Iowa. Went to college there where I met my wife. And we've since moved all over, spent some time in uh, Maryland and now five years in Colorado. So my background was as a market analyst initially been working on product development for manufacturing and industrial. Eventually got involved in telematics, telematics for a, a division of Stanley's infrastructure group, which brought me into supply chain. Worked for a, a couple of value-added distributors that focus on fleet enablement before really making the jump over to enterprise supply chain software, where my specialization has been mostly in execution, so warehouse management, transportation management, and then had the benefit uh, a few years ago of being recruited by the team here at, at DAT to help grow this, this shipper portion of their business. I love it. I love it. And again, I think when people hear of DAT, they think that's for brokers to find carriers, that's for people... I don't think we traditionally think of shippers using it, but I told you a use case that I had just before COVID with somebody I was advising saying, use the DAT trend line. So people are using it that way already. So I'm glad you guys are selling this now actively to shippers. So before we get into the metrics that matter, tell us the market is going to be okay. <laughs> Give us the market update. <laughs> You, you mentioned Dr. Kaplis, who is our chief scientist. He came over as part of the, the shipper business acquisition from Chainalytics. We've also got Ken Adamo, our chief of analytics, who provides regular market updates. But unfortunately, even with all of the data at our fingertips, we don't have a crystal ball, right? This is a, a two-year period now where dry van and temp control has been inverted. This is probably the deepest inverted period. Please explain what you mean by that for those of us who aren't into it every single day. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Traditionally, your contract rates, the rates that you agree to with your network, those are always going to be a more favorable set of rates than what you're going to get on the spot market or sort of ad hoc, where you're moving date freight that has either fallen out of your routing guide or it's unanticipated, you don't have coverage in that area. Those rates traditionally are always going to be higher, right? Think about it as if instead of taking a, a regularly scheduled bus, you're calling a cab. 
right? And and that is the natural order of things. However, for the last two years, the market has actually flipped coming out of COVID where, as you mentioned, rates had spiked. It was a really profitable environment for all these carriers. And when the volume dropped coming out of the pandemic, there was all of this, what we call loose capacity, right? Which essentially just means extra trucks. And as a result of all of that loose capacity in the market, spot rates started to dip. And so what we've seen over the last few years is the spot rates becoming more competitive than the contract rates, which essentially reverses the entire natural order. Of <laughs> so what percentage of all lanes are contracted versus, let me say, there's managed trans, then there's contract, and then there's spot. Do you have any sense for the percentage roughly? I know it's probably only God knows those numbers, but do you have a sense for it? Yeah. In an ideal world, uh, as a shipper, you are taking sort of a portfolio approach to moving your freight in. And Chris talks about this a lot. So some lanes, especially high volume, high frequency lanes, you want to move that on a contract because it's regular freight, high volume, you can negotiate a good price. Infrequent lanes are almost always going to go to spot, right? Unless you can find a certain carrier. Now, there's also dedicated, there's private fleet, there's a variety of options you can take, and there's no one size fits all. But generally speaking, if you are a shipper, which is who I deal with day in and day out, you would like the majority of your freight to be moved on contracted lanes. It makes forecasting and budgeting a heck of a lot easier. Yes. You've got those strong relationships with those brokers and carriers that you can lean on in times of need. And from a pre-pandemic perspective, for a long time, there was annual or multi-annual contracts that were these long-standing contracts that just really made life easy for everybody. I, I can't give you an exact percentage, but when you are talking to large shippers, the way that they prefer to operate is to have a sizable majority of their freight moving contract. Yep. Yeah. And it's, to me, it always blew me away that there was even a spot market. I came from automotive where we had those long-term relationships. And I always say, when you have those relationships that are contract or managed trans, the account familiarity, when I can say the word, is so great that they know your lane. They know all of the unique nuances of your business. So they say, oh, I know that Doc closes at 4 p.m. I know this guy wants me to text him when I'm in the parking lot. Whatever all the things are, you learn those when you have contracted or managed transportation. The spot is a little iffier because you don't work with those guys on a regular basis. Maybe you've never worked with them. You're, you're paying more, but I my, my first thought is paying more is one thing, but them not knowing how we work and me know, not knowing, and by the way, in our horrible We've had freight fraud in this market. I think it me means we all want to know more about who we're working with. So <laughs> these, there's some real advantage to your point of working contracted where you say, I'm, I've got these deep relationships. We're not dating. We're not engaged. We're married to those, <laughs> those carriers. That's right. And you mentioned uh, something that I thought was really interesting earlier, and I can wrap up my market update portion. It's been a tough couple of years from a, a carrier and broker perspective. And, and I think the inversion was true during the pandemic for the shippers. But simply put, truckload rates can't continue to fall forever. Capacity will continue to exit the market. We see it on the load board side of our business. You have to have sustainable contract rates. So the market can't revert forever on reduced supply. Demand will rise. As of right now, our current forecasts for the dry van and temp control markets do suggest a reversion likely in Q1 of 25, uh, which maybe isn't the, the news everybody wants to hear. But at the same time, we're approaching almost halfway through the 24 year. And so as the shippers we work with are contemplating annual bids, 12 month bid cycles, if they're running them or getting their budgets into place for the next four fiscal quarters, they, there is definitely, I think, awareness on the shipper side that this market won't stay forever. And to treat your partners in a fair manner while it is down to ensure that you can maintain those strong relationships with the folks that you trust. Yeah. Somebody called me right after COVID, just after it started, two weeks in, and they said, hey, Joe, I've worked with them in the past, and they said, our rates, they're fair right now, but rates are going to drop like a rock because there's not going to be the need for as much freight. And I'm just thinking, we should go back in and renegotiate. And I was like, 
nah, I don't know. I was like, who knows? I go, that doesn't really fit what you say, how you want to work. Like you always say you want to be a partner. And he goes, yeah, that's why I'm calling you. So we talked for a little bit. And he goes, I don't think I'm going to do it. And I, <laughs> he didn't. And then I keep thinking, imagine calling your carriers in early March, just before, as COVID was beginning and saying, hey, I really need you to reduce your rates. And then <laughs> a month later, they're calling and saying, hey, guess what? <laughs> You're going to pay through the nose. And that would be going for a couple of years in a row. So the partnerships work. And I think it's a two-sided partnership too. I think there's always the the perspective that it, it's a dog-eat-dog world, I think, especially in logistics. But it's really interesting talking with the shippers who we work with who are really in tune with market volatility and, and what's going on from a data perspective. Uh, I remember having a conversation at one of our kind of customer advisory meetings with a, a large shipper and talking about capacity exiting the market and how difficult it's been for some of these folks to stay afloat. And he gave me a really interesting albeit anecdotal example, where he had a, a partner, longtime partner that he's been working with in the carrier space, and they put out a put out an RFP, and the carrier essentially came back at a price that he knew was not profitable, right? Or, or maybe scraping Marginally, the, yeah. the barest margin off of it. And he said, in, in some instances, they'll go back to these carriers and say, look, you're delivering on time and in full. You've provided a good level of service. Like we can meet you in the middle, right? They would much rather maintain those partners that they have good relationships with than see their entire network churn out and have to renegotiate every contract. I I always remember a customer that I had, and I won't mention their name. We would go over there. We were doing mostly less than truckload for them, maybe a dozen truckloads, but hundreds per week. And I remember when we would have go over the scorecards with them every week. And we talk about every single, sh we talk about the KPIs. We talk about every shipment that went bad and what we're going to do to prevent it. And I remember after one of the meetings, I got a call from the, our customer and she said, just want to let you know, you, we're really happy with what you guys are doing. And I want to make sure you're making money on this account. And I remember thinking, Oh my God, hallelujah. Like I wasn't looking to take advantage. I, I just said, no, we are, we're making, we're making money on this. She said, because you've saved us a lot of money. And I said, by the way, we were not using the DAT trend line, which we should have, because I, she, we were kept lowering the cost, but that was, I kept saying the wind is at our back. The rates are going to go back up and we're not going to be able to deliver the same great savings. But to have a customer like that actually says, let's make sure you're surviving <laughs> is you don't forget that that was 15 years ago. Anyway, today's topic is DAT IQ, the metrics that matter with my friend Samuel Parker. And I want to talk about, now that you've disappointed us with the market going, <laughs> taking a long time to recover, I want to talk about the metrics that matter. I know you won't disappoint on this. Oh, but before we get into that, you mentioned Ken Adamo and Chris Kaplis. I know you guys create, you have a podcast and lots of, uh, great information on that. I'll make sure we put a link in the show notes to that podcast. What's the name? I, I was afraid. Is it Freightvine? Freightvine. Yeah. So Dr. Kaplis hosts that. He's got a, a whole repertoire of probably similar people to yourself, Joe, from the shipper world, from the logistics world. And he puts that out on a monthly basis. Yep. I've had Chris on the podcast to talk about his other job <laughs> at MIT. So he is uh, a professor at MIT, which is arguably the number one supply chain podcast in the world. I know my friend Jason Miller over here at Michigan State would argue with that, but <laughs> one of the top supply chain schools. So anyway, I'll make sure we put a link to those, to that podcast so people can reach out. And that is going to be very much database. You're not going to hear a, a subjective nonsense like I spew. <laughs> anyway, the metrics that matter. Walk us through the metrics that matter. And first off, what Dat IQ is for shippers, and you're giving shippers information that matters. What is that information? Yeah. So I, I think from a little bit of a, a contextual perspective to set the stage, these solutions were originally uh, part of an acquisition by DAT in which Dr. Kaplis came over as well from a company formerly known as Chainalytics, where they had built out a data analyst practice to go with their consulting practice. And so that acquisition of FMIC, which is the Freight Market Intelligence Consortium, is what became DAT's shipper business today. 
And there was a few, I think, major drivers behind that acquisition, especially when you think about a company as old as DAT that's been in this space for so long. Why make the break and, and jump into the shipper space? I think a lot of that lies in the pandemic, but also in technology advancements, right? So going through the last four or five years, the market cycles have been much more volatile. There's a whole lot more fluctuation in supply and demand. Some of that can be laid at the foot of omni-channel commerce, somewhat of the Amazon effect. Some of it is just changing consumer expectations, right? And making sure that your product is uh, where it needs to be, when it needs to be, and, and the nature of how uh, the movement of goods is evolving. But customer centricity is a top priority, especially for shippers, right? And so you're thinking about things like shorter delivery window times, cost optimization, flexible network, which means that you have the ability to get goods to different areas and different modes at different times. And ultimately, I think you're just seeing a diversification of the way that transportation and logistics functions for shippers. All of that comes down on the head of who? <laughs> the purchasing guy. <laughs> the person responsible for moving the goods. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And so these transportation and logistics executives, these have become strategic issues within the business. Transportation managers are increasingly in the spotlight. It's a new seat at the table to some extent, but you need to have a strategy for transportation planning and how you manage your transportation. And these are not necessarily things that people were dealing with 20, 30 years ago. And it's not necessarily things that everybody's equipped to deal with today. Yeah, if I could add, if I could add one little thing in there, when I was selling logistics services, a lot of times you'd be talking to the guy out back who was responsible for the trucks. And I would say, do you have a TMS? And he'd say, oh, I don't need one. I get text messages from this guy. This guy emails me rates. And they were spending millions of dollars. And then I would talk to their purchasing guy and the purchasing guy, a lot of times, I'm sure other people experience this would say, I just let Tony or Bob or whoever is out back manage that purchasing. And I know why they did it because they didn't understand how to manage it. So, but as soon as those numbers got higher and say, Hey, the company's grown now we're $10 million. I got to make sure Tony isn't selling our business for Red Wings tickets or Bruin tickets or <laughs> Cowboy tickets. And that's, that happens. And so I noticed, I in fact, I had customers who we had won the business through the logistics team. Now, all of a sudden, we have to talk to purchasing and purchasing is asking for a whole new this. And what purchasing typically wants is a tool that lets them look at metrics and they want KPIs to judge their suppliers by. That didn't, that wasn't true 20 years ago. It, they, it just was a separate organization that didn't do and, it. And I think it's absolutely the, the right point and what we see very frequently every day with our customers. And as a result of those increased expectations and connectivity, analytics becomes essential to that. You have to align your logistics team with your network design, your sourcing team, your procurement folks, it, it really creates a, a higher level of expectation. And I think along with that scrutiny, now the C-suite says, hey, you're the transportation guy. I expect you to have your finger on the pulse of the market. You're the expert here, right? So if we need to add new lanes, if we need to add new capacity, you're the guy we're looking to be the expert on all of this. We want to maximize our cost while I'm sorry, minimize our cost while maximizing our service. And for a lot of folks, especially the ones like you're talking about who either you know, don't have a TMS, maybe they have a TMS that's from whenever, an acquisition, who knows, you have very limited visibility into your own data and next to no visibility into the market <laughs> right. data versus unless you're getting it from your partners or your carriers. So that's the context is basically we're now more than ever, especially, and I, I think it accelerated dur during COVID. It began, I think, 10, 20 years ago where procurement teams started realizing transportation costs matter and we have a way with the transportation management systems. We have ways to get good analytics that we can judge our partners by. And by the way, I've always said this, when I sold logistics services, I said, here's how I would like to be judged. And I think good service providers want to be judged objectively. And I've always said the nature of our business is as a business of exceptions. If I'm moving 
a hundred shipments for you this week, Samuel, and we don't have a meeting to go over the KPIs or at least a report that you're sent, you're going to go, yeah, they were late on two. <laughs> and then when I call and say, how are we doing? You go, yeah, you're late on two. Yeah, but we did 98 that were on time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I forgot about those. <laughs> This is a business of exceptions if you let it be. You're absolutely right. And I think along with that, there's a desire for more than just data. I think the data in and of itself can be useful. The number of shippers with their own data science teams and major departments is not significant. But I think where the real value lies is from an insights perspective, deeper insights into trends in the market, recommendations on areas of underperformance, how you deal with certain levels of volatility. And ultimately, if you're the person who's accountable for your spend to get your goods where they need to be on time, in full, in an ideal world, there's some accountability there. And and as you're talking about, these guys need to have the insights to be able to make that justification and, and continue to prove themselves as the experts within the business in this sort of ever increasingly complex environment. So you guys can bring Again, we're talking about the the metrics that matter, which is in debt IQ. So if I'm a a shipper and I'm having those weekly or monthly or maybe quarterly meetings with my broker or my 3PL, I can have KPIs that we developed. And they say this, the rates went up a little bit this little, went up a little bit this month. And I go, oh, okay. Sounds good. I guess I, I trust him. <laughs> what, what am I going to do otherwise? And you have an answer. <laughs> you have the otherwise. We do. And we have a really unique position through which we deliver that information, right? Because we work with all three sides. We see what rates are when they're posted to our load board. We see contractual rates and replacement rates when we get data contributed from our broker customers, from our shipper customers. And we're able to amalgamate that into this IQ product, the IQ platform that creates this really deep level of visibility into what's going on in the market. And the three big things that we see customers coming to us for, especially on the shipper side. Number one is just straight up rate data. What should I be paying for this lane? I've got a bid that I want to put out. I've got a new distribution center that I'm adding a a network to. I have no idea what's the right price in this part of the country at this time of year, right? And in this market cycle, right, where we're at. So that's the most basic kind of standard use case that we see. And then I think you get into to what I consider to be some of the more interesting ones. So the next one is capacity. So I'm looking to add capacity, right? I'm starting to move more LTL. I need visibility into what the capacity is in different markets. Is it a loose market? Is it a tight market? And for those of you listening at home, essentially that means how many trucks are available in that market at any given time. You want to try and move a, a shipment of goods out of Florida during growing season, good luck. That's going to be a tall order. And you might not have anything to do with growing season, but you're still impacted by what's going on in the market. And then I think finally, the third one, which is a little more strategic, that's a, what we call benchmarking. And, and that's our, our new IQ benchmark product that's in the IQ platform specializes in that. But essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it allows you to take your freight spend and benchmark it against the market. So whereas the rates and capacity metrics are really just uh, one size fits all, right? You can take a look and see, hey, what's going on in this lane? You can actually take your own data and specifically look at an area of your network and benchmark it against other people who are the same size as you, other people who might be moving, call it reefer versus dry van, down to the lane level or the zip code level to see how good of a deal am I getting on this? And that's super important when you're thinking about putting a new RFP out into the market, when you're sitting back at the end of the year and you want to evaluate how well your service partners basically priced you. And when you're looking for forecasting into the future, these are huge activities within most companies. Right. I want to go back and talk about each one of these individually. So the first one you said was visibility into rates. And that's, so visibility into rates, capacity and benchmarking. So first is visibility into rates. So if I'm a shipper and I say, okay, I'm going out for bid, I send it out. Now, if I'm send, sending it out to carriers, is there a, a so is, does DAT split out brokers versus carried carriers? Because I know brokers are typically going to add a little bit of money to things. 
Yeah, so you can see data based on kind of contribution. Most of our shipper customers, as you can imagine, like to compare themselves to other shippers, uh, especially shippers of similar size who are moving maybe a similar amount of volume and have similar amounts of leverage as opposed to a small shipper. But yeah, you can use our tools provide rate visibility to a very tactical day-to-day -day operations level, where if some freight falls out of your routing guide and you need to source somebody to help you move it through, you can take a look at that individual lane and see based on the latest contributions, what a fair range might be. Yeah. And one of the challenges, and again, I've been on a few sides of this, is if you were to say to a shipper right now, hey, what is Chicago to Atlanta? What's that cost right now? They say, oh, we last week we paid this much, whatever. I don't even, I have no idea what that rate is right now. <laughs> I'm afraid to know. <laughs> whatever that rate is, you say, we paid that much last week and something that might be different this week. We'll call four guys and we'll get four different, four different prices. Now, first off, I'm wasting time for most of my people. And brokers after a while, carriers after a while, start to recognize the nonsense, right? You're just... You don't have you don't have dad IQ, so you are creating a very rudimentary <laughs> rate visibility tool based on four whole <laughs> phone calls you made. Yeah, you your survey of the market. <laughs> yes, your market survey. Congrats! You tell the boss, "Yeah, I was busy this morning. I did a market survey," but maybe they all know you overpay, <laughs> right? And your freight is always different. That's the nature of what we do. Is whether it was a lift gate that required access accessorial or you live certain place. But anyway, getting back to it, you have actual rates that, so I might say, I always pay X for that, but the DAT rate is X minus 1%. I'm, I'm good with that. As long as I, I say I'm close enough, but I want to be able to explain to my boss that I have real information here because if he said, oh, tell me about the market survey you did. Oh, yeah, I made those four phone calls today. I remember, <laughs> I would much rather say I invested in a tool that gives me a, that proves that we're doing the right thing or help us get on track. Absolutely. And I think that's really where the size of the data contributions we have plays such a huge role because you can really get down to, I could give you Houston, Texas to Charlotte, North Carolina. Based on your data contribution, we can look at what your company cost was versus the benchmark cost. We can look at the delta to that cost. And if you're 5% below benchmark or 5% above benchmark, that, that could well be within your threshold of tolerance. But if you're 40% above benchmark, then maybe I need to have a conversation with that carrier. Yeah. And I know we're talking about shippers right now, but I remember when I was a uh a carrier. I worked for a carrier, but I was using broke was brokering some freight. And I always remember this Baltimore to Midland, Texas. And we won the business. And I was like, oh my God, that's fantastic. I was very excited. It was like a decent amount of freight. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to kill it. And then my ops team called and said, hey, we can't find anybody to do that. I go, would it at a good rate? Or he goes, no, can't find anybody to do at that. All. <laughs> and I was like, Midland, get on my computer, Midland, Texas, people go there. And then the guy, then my ops guy said, Joe, I've talked to a few carriers who have drivers who live in Midland, Texas, who won't take that business right now. And so I did that like at a $5 loss per lane. And I was thinking it's just because, and that's the problem with, and again, I'm speaking from a, a broker or carrier side, we won four lanes out of 40. But we basically, what we proved is we don't have as much information on those four lanes is what it basically came down to. So congratulations, you won the business that you didn't know anything about. <laughs> so anyway, getting back to it, you have to have some real data to help you avoid stepping in it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's interesting, one of those things where the, if you build it, they will come. But we see our customers using these tools in more than just the tactical lane rate way, right? So they'll use it for lane level analysis is probably the most common use case that we see. A lot of them use these tools for reporting up to their management to show that they are competitive with the market. They'll use it as a gauge against inflation. So what's your cost change versus the index trend? How are you handling that? 
carrier analysis, right? It's it can definitely be a, a form of carrier scorecard. Yeah, I, I know they're using it for port stuff because I, I did it when I was still in automotive. If we get it, if we get it in LA and ship it, versus getting it out of Houston, and we could do it real quickly. Anyway, so visibility into rates, obviously we want that. And then we're talking about shippers, but this also applies to brokers. You talk to, <laughs> you'll talk to brokers too when they call or carriers. The next one is capacity. Please explain how that works. Visibility into capacity. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier, so I'll, I'll drop back to it. But one of the features that, that we have is actually the ability to really look at a map and see very simple stoplight, green, yellow, red, how tight capacity is in different markets. And so as you're looking at that lane level analysis, that might have helped you from Baltimore. Exactly. <laughs> it, would have, it would have said red. It would have been a whole bunch of red on that. On that. Well, it may, it maybe it just would have been white, like not <laughs> any drivers at all. But so that's one component of it. That's a very tactical piece. I, I think when you're thinking about capacity, we mentioned earlier, let's say, well, let's say you're opening a new distribution center. Maybe it's in the Southeast, you haven't had distribution there before, so you've got to build out a network. As part of your prep for the RFP for your new distribution center, you're going to utilize our tools to look at where the market's at, what trends are in that area. You're going to look at capacity, you're going to look at pricing, and ultimately that will help inform the the budget range that that as a shipper you would put together in expectation for that RFP, right? And I think historically it's just like you said, we'll send it out to ten different brokers and we'll just see who we'll see what the range is as it comes back and, and what the reputation survey. is. And so this kind of tries to take a lot of the guesswork out of that and provide a, a better prepared analysis when you do that RFP prep. And then finally, I, I think we mentioned this a little bit as well, analysis and review of your partners. So as you're looking, maybe you want to give additional loads to a partner that you feel has been a very high level of service provider to you. This allows you to then take a look on the rate side and make sure that they've been competitive from a rate perspective as well. And so all of those scenarios feed into how a customer of ours might use the tool when they're evaluating capacity. Yep. Yep. I love that. And when we don't have tools like that IQ, I know what happens because I participated in it. Um, I've asked a favor of a friend, would you go and look at all these rates that uh, a shipper I know has and let me know? And they go, are we going to have a chance to win the business? And I say, yeah, win the RFP. I just need to. And so it's basically market testing them. And then that's a big favor to ask. And then if you say, oh, no, there's nothing in it for you. I'll buy you lunch next time we see each other. That's not... That is not what anybody wants to do, but we've all been on that other side of an RFP and you go, they have a whole bunch of brokers or carriers they're working with and they want to do an RFP just to market test to see if their carriers and their brokers are still there. And sometimes it would be like, I've been working with Samuel for seven years. I like the service. The price seems right. I market test and then say, okay, Samuel's price is about right. Or I say, Samuel, there's an extra $30 in there. You got to come down if you want to keep the business. Now, what does that do to these other guys? After a while, they're like, I want nothing to do with helping market test my competition. And we do that. That's what you do when you don't have data. (laughs) Absolutely. And I, I think one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is the fact that this data comes from contributions, right? This is not data that we're purchasing from a third party. We are not actively bidding or in any way involved in any of this freight. So there's no bias to the data. We talk to very large companies, Fortune 20 companies, and they go, will will our data skew if we contribute? And at the point where we've got one and a half billion dollars in freight spend, you're not going to move the needle too much. And and so that allows for what we consider to be a very impartial look at the market, especially when you talk about benchmarking. Yeah, I love it. So we got into this benchmarking and you, I wrote this down before we hit record. You said benchmarking against freight rate market cycle. What do you mean by market cycle? Yeah. In addition to the kind of seasonal trends and changes that you see in capacity, there's also the factor of what's going on in the larger market, which we touched on at the beginning of this call, where you may pay more because you're moving something out of Florida during growing season. But because of where we're at in the freight cycle currently, which is dredging along the bottom, I think I heard someone refer to it as, 
it's still going to be a, a decent chunk of savings that over maybe what you would have paid in 2021 or 2022, certainly 2020. And so that's one of those things where you can look at a lane historically, or you can look at an area of your network historically and see what might have been a reasonable price to pay. But I think there's a recency bias and the ongoing contribution of data helps us combat that recency bias to understand if one of my trusted carriers comes to me and says, this is going to be 30% above what you typically pay, there's probably a good reason for that. But you have to be able to validate that, especially as you go report up to your boss, right? Yeah. What is that? The old Russian saying, I think it's trust, but verify, right? <laughs> I completely trust you, but I also use Dan IQ, so I'll just double check. <laughs> and ultimately, I have to justify that at the end of the day, right? I, I can't just say, Jim, he's a really good guy. He wouldn't steer us wrong. <laughs> you and I, before we hit record, we were talking about this is when we're talking about benchmarking. In large companies, and I've been part of this, and I know you said you have too, when you go to the C-suite and they say, oh, transportation costs went up this much. And so the big boss says, why'd they go up? And they say, because our 3PL said they went up or our carriers said they went up. Did they actually, does the market go up? When you want to do that market survey, what we call four other companies? <laughs> like, so that's not going to be a good answer. And I've joked about this, but it's not even a lie. When you go see senior management in a Fortune 500 company, you are usually, you've got down to 10 slides, but you might have 100 slides in backup. <laughs> and that is when they start drilling down, and this is what VPs always do, they pick one thing and they drill all the way down and make sure you have all the answers. And if you don't have a market benchmark, you don't have all the answers. You are just basically saying, we trusted our, we trust our, and by the way, maybe you do trust your 3PL and your brokers, and I, I hope you do, but it's still not good enough because they're never going to, most of them aren't going to say, hey, good news, rates went down 5%. And we lowered our price this week because they might say we lost money last year on the same lane. We need market research. And by the way, I've said this before, this bugs me as a, somebody who's advocated for shippers and sometimes is, when the rates go up, or so when truckload rates go up 20%, and then the the broker says, yeah, our rates went up 20% too. Wait, what? Your rate went up 20%? Yeah, because we get a percentage, 20, we got a mar our margin went up. So did the job get harder for you? No, just the same. It's just as easy. Just, so I, I would want, if I was a shipper, I would say, I don't mind, I want my, if I have a broker in the middle, if I have a 3PL in the middle, Cool. Make sure you're adding value. Otherwise, I don't want you there. But I also don't want when the market jumps, I don't want you making more money. And what's funny, I, I love the anecdote about the 100 slides behind the 10 slides, because if you think about the folks who utilize our products every day, and I'll give a, I'll give a, a little plug here, right? Dr. Kaplis and myself and, and some others of our team, we host a, a monthly, we call it a roundtable for any of our shipper customers where they all jump on. We talk about what's going on in the market. We give a little market update and, and basically have an open discussion, which is really awesome to see that all these different shippers come together and talk about their problems or, or opportunities as it were, right? But uh, one of the interesting things is the average user who's in our rate products looking at lane level truckloads, right? That's transportation analyst, maybe a logistics manager, somebody like that. Those aren't the folks that always join the roundtable calls, right? Sometimes it is the vice president. Sometimes it is the, the head of logistics who who's, like, yeah, I've been talking to my guys about what they're seeing in the tool, but I want to hear it from, I want to hear it from you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's always a very stressful moment when you're there because it, no one wants to go into the vice president's conference room and look like a fool and have to walk back out with all your friends and go, I hope none of us are getting fired on them <laughs> because of our, our tomfoolery. Anyway, um, talking to Samuel Parker, and we're just talking about DAT IQ, the metrics that matter. So those metrics are visibility into rates, capacity, and benchmarking. So I want to know what the rates are. I want to know what the capacity is. I do want to have a tool that lets me show my vice president that I am doing a good job. We talked around RFPs a few times today. So I think there's a trend to do more RFPs and we're going to do more RFPs. We can do them quarterly. I know there's tools out there now that makes it easier. And I, the advantage, and I would say of, the, of a quarterly RFP or maybe even a seasonal RFP is you give the broker or the carrier 3PL 
they only have to get they only have to understand the next 12 weeks so they can potentially give you a little better price you're not asking them to see a year into the future like a fortune teller how does that work into all of this yeah i i would say it's probably a top driver along with volatility for reasons that people come to us. Running a bid is, sure, maybe it's a little easier nowadays than it used to be on pen and paper, where you all have to sit on the conference call for the, a week. Even Excel spreadsheets was ridiculous. And by the way, as a carrier, I worked at one. When you get that email from someone you haven't talked to in a year, and they just send you an email saying, hey, please fill up this Excel spreadsheet. Excel spreadsheet with thousands of lanes. Yeah. And I remember the first time I got one, I thought it was going to be rich. I thought there's a thousand lanes. And then I talked to the vice president of operations. He goes, and he started going by state. He goes, we're only interested in these states, this lane. There was like 20 lanes in there. I was like, and then we didn't, then we won five. I was like, damn it. No, and, and it's, it is, we hear it talking to our customers on the shipper side. The expectation is, hey, if you want to keep up with the market, you, you run these mini bids or these mini RFPs and tools for making it easier notwithstanding, that's just more times of the year that you have to be on top of what's going on in the market. You have to have your pulse, right? Your finger on the pulse of that capacity of what rates are doing. And so it just, I think, if anything, enhances the need for that level of visibility and monitoring that DAT's IQ platform provides. So before we put a bow on this one and wrap it up, if somebody's listening and they're a shipper and they say, okay, how does this work? How, if I want to, if I want to, if I want to use DAT, how do I go about that? So let's, they reach out to you and you connect them with the right people within DAT. What's that process look like? Yeah, it depends on your needs and every shipper is a little different, but I will say we've got folks who specialize in individual verticals, working with companies in those verticals, and, and we have a great, what we call our DAS team, which is data analytics services. And you can get up and running on one of like our rate view products in very short order, which gives you that lane level market visibility. The new flagship product that, that we're releasing, the IQ Benchmark, that is one that that you can be up on in a matter of weeks. It, it really the biggest solution down we sometimes see with that is how long it takes people to get their data together and contribute it if it's sitting in a million different silos but none of this is a lengthy process and we have uh, a, a very low level of what we call churn once those folks get on the platform <clears throat> most of them stick with us it, it's a really eye-opening tool and i would encourage anybody who's tasked with moving freight and managing that that cost center it's worth taking a look and it, it could potentially make your life a lot easier Yep. I've told you this before. I used DAT at, when I was at a little 3PL. We used DAT to help us, especially when there was lanes we couldn't get trucks on. And it also, we ended up building some nice relationships. But another time I was representing a shipper and I said, as the new 3PL was in, in, implemented, doing a lot of transportation, I said, I want the DAT trend line in here. And they said, should we be above the DAT trend line or below it? Meaning we're paying less. And I said, I don't know. I just want to see it parallel. I don't ever want to see the rates overall in the market going down while your rates are staying the same or going up. And I said, it's just, it, you're spending so much money. And that was a company that's probably spending well over 70 million a year. It's a small investment to have so much more insight. And all of what we talked about today, it's not about creating reports. It's not about, It's not even about just having the insight. It's about having good conversations because I can't just, I can call you and say, hey, Sam, your rates are too high. And you go, no, they aren't. Oh, yeah, they are. And you say, no, they're not. That's not a useful conversation. What's useful is to say, here's the DAT trend line and we are looking at that and always comparing our performance. And when I say our performance, the shipper, the carrier, and the broker, it's our performance. Because a lot of times when some shipper complains that the price are too high, it's because they're giving the information to the shipper, to the carrier, and the broker too late. They're doing things that delay the process. So it is our performance. That's why we need this to measure our performance. Anyway, enough of my blather. I'm going to summarize, then I want your final thoughts on this. So I'm talking to my friend Samuel Parker, and we're talking about DAT IQ, the metrics that matter. He also gave us a market update. It's not the best market update, but it's probably accurate, knowing DAT. And we talked about 
this visibility into rates. And that's so you know what the market's paying. You also need to know what capacity is. A lot of brokers will say they know capacity. Carriers know capacity. I don't know that a lot of shippers understand capacity. And then last but not least, benchmark against freight rate market cycle. So you want to be able to benchmark against something. I know, by the way, I, that I know Dad IQ has a whole bunch of other stuff. These are the big three. And then last but not least, we just talked about the RFP process. Put a big old bow on this one, Samuel Parker. Yeah, I think that as we continue to see volatility throughout the freight market, as we continue to see fluctuations in pricing and demand, as well as the technology to deliver products, this continues to become a more complex landscape. And with the data that's available today through solutions like DAT, there's no reason for you as an expert, as the person in charge of transportation and logistics to not have all available insights at your fingertips, right? And at the end of the day, you are the expert and we simply provide a a level playing field in the visibility of what's going on in the market, what's a fair price and what performance, what good performance looks like. Excellent. Excellent. Samuel, I'll make sure I put a link to your LinkedIn profile, a link to your website and any other links you and your marketing team give me, including you guys, I know have some reports on where the market's going. And we'll also put a link to Chris Kaplis has that podcast. Do you have a, that's Freightvine. Do you guys do another podcast too? We do the IQ market update with Ken Adamo and Dean. With Ken. Crow. Okay. So we'll put a link to that too. What kind of, first off, my last interview, I was talking to Nicole Glenn and she said, I'm going to dat, dat, datcom. And I said, oh, wait a sec. When is that? And I wasn't sure of the date or the or the location, but I think it's in the Midwest, <laughs> Kansas City. It, it is. Yeah. So last year was in, in Texas. This year we're moving a little bit north. So DATCON 24 is October 22nd through the 24th in Kansas City. Say that date one more time. October 22nd through the 24th in Kansas City. Oh, nice weather. I like it when I don't have to leave my time zone. (laughs) I'm willing to go to Central. (laughs) I'm in Eastern. Easy for everyone. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So what goes on? I know that is has a shipper-specific day. Am I right to say that? Yeah. So if you are a member of our shipper customer base that utilizes our benchmark products, you're invited for a shipper shipper only day. It's the day before everyone else arrives. And we host a, a number of roundtables panels with large shipper customers, with experts in the market put on by myself and, and Dr. Kaplis, among others. It's a great day to, to interact with the other shippers. And then a surprising amount of them decide to stay when the rest of the show opens, when we bring in brokers and the rest of kind of DAT's customer base for a couple of days of panels and speakers on everything from what's going on in the freight market to how to improve your margins. Yep. So you have to hire like a whole bunch of bouncers to, to prevent the brokers and the carriers from sneaking in <laughs> into the day one. <laughs> See, that's why we have it the day before. Nobody's there yet, but we do get a few folks wandering by looking in the door. <laughs> looking in the window, lingering outside. <laughs> Uh, everybody plays really well together. It's a really great event. See, I love that. I love that shipper focused. It's very interesting. My friend Jim does a shipper survey every two years, and it's just why they buy. He's a marketing guy, and he said the biggest problem. We, I help him every other year when he does it. And he says, Joe, the biggest problem is brokers and carriers want to answer on behalf of shippers. <laughs> I was like, Yep, <laughs> they know better. Anyway, I love what you guys are doing. And I, I hope to be at DAT, I said DATCOM, but it's DATCON, and that's October 22nd through the 24th. We'll also make sure we put a link to that. What other conferences will we see you and the fine folks from DAT at? Probably all all conferences from what I gather. We do have a number of them, but actually the biggest one coming up on the horizon just two weeks away here is the the Gartner Supply Chain Expo and Symposium down in Orlando, Florida. So our shipper team will be there. Dr. Kaplis will be giving a presentation. It's one of the events I look forward to the most every year. Not so much going to Orlando, but to engage with all of those all of those shippers and the analysts that, that congregate in that space. Awesome. If you want to find that, it's easy to find them. They're everywhere. <laughs> Samuel, thank you so much. I love what you guys are doing. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. 
You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.